Well, thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, we're going to get to know each other real well because we're going to go on a walk through the forest of Africa and end up next door in Kerry. So it's good that we have a small group because you don't want a lot of people when you're walking through on elephant trails through the forest because uh, you never know when an elephant's going to come out charging from behind a tree. So you always have to be looking, using your peripheral vision as you're going along. Um, so again, I'm Richard Carroll. I'm wearing my Master Gardener pin proudly, a class of uh, 2018 with my colleagues here. Um, but in a, in a past life, I was uh, the vice president for Madag Africa and Madagascar for the World Wildlife Fund. And in a past life before that, I was out here in the forest studying these guys, um, gorillas, Western lowland gorillas. And um, you know, in, in my work with, in, in the conservation of the Congo, I worked a lot with Jane Goodall. And if you've ever seen Jane do a, a lecture, she always starts off with a chimp hoot call. But since my research subject are gorillas, we're going to start off with a chest beat. So everybody's going to start off with a chest beat. And now it's open hands. <laughs> open hands. It's not a fist. You know, it's open hands. They're drumming on that, that uh, leathery chest of theirs. But um, that's so they can stay in touch and, and communicate. And it's also sometimes aggression. Um, but you know, people uh, look like their subjects, and I looked a bit like a gorilla in that. Uh, but in that, another way to think about this is uh, uh, saying in the spirit of the forest in, um, in Zanga Sanga. Zanga Sanga is a park that I set up, and we'll hear more about it in the Central African Republic. But um, as we go through, we're gonna look at the values of the forest, the richness of the forest, and as we go along, we're gonna think about um, the, the uh, conditions for conservation. And I'll try to point those out as we go along because I'm going to show that the Congo, Namibia, other places that I've worked in Africa is very similar to what Richard Wilson sitting in the back and I and others are doing to try to keep the canopy in carriage. So we're on our journey now. And, you know, this is self-portrait, and, you know, I'm scratching my head here thinking, well, how, how, do, we, how do we make this happen? How do we get conservation going uh, in, in this area? Uh, but this area, first of all, to let you know, is this big swath of green across the middle of Africa. Uh, Gina was a Peace Corps volunteer down in what's now Democratic Republic of Congo, former Zaire. Uh, but what that star is, in the southwest corner of the Central African Republic uh, near Cameroon and Congo is where Zanga Sanga is. And, that's, and we'll, we'll hear more about that name as we go along. And so my vision when I was with WWF, my, my, one of my objectives was setting up a conservation plan for the Congo Basin. And we're going to look at how that happened. So first of all, it was the vision thing. Looking at that forest and, and looking at the whole entirety of that forest, as well as the individual components, and how to, how to keep it in business uh, for the next century. Um, it, you know, the idea was to, to create a conservation uh, program so that my friend and mentor, uh, Makema, could you know, walk on elephant trails through intact forests from the, from the mountains of the moon to the Gulf of Guinea, all the way across the continent. You know, and on his way, he'd see this sea of green bisected by, you know, old rivers uh, going through the forest, um, go through trees with the big buttress roots uh, to uh, support them in the, the heavy winds that come through the forest at times and the sh actually shallow soils in these, in these forests. But in the center, all, all elephant trails lead to Zanga. Uh, Zanga is a, a, a clearing, a pan, but in, pygmy, in the Baca, the pygmy language, it's called a Bai, B-A-I. And you see all trails lead to Zanga and it's crisscrossed with elephant trails. Um, and uh, there you go. And at any time of day now, you see 50 to 100 elephants out there, and they, they uh, 
use their trunks like pneumatic drills going down into this marshy soil blowing up holes in it and they get the minerals uh, and the, uh, this is how they get their salts and these areas were probably ancient termite mounds and termites brought up minerals uh, into the soil and uh, forest elephants I mean if you go to the zoo which I did with the Cub Scouts on Saturday <laughs> you see savanna elephants the big elephants with a huge tusk well the forest elephants and this is a theme for the forest are they're smaller in body size, have smaller ears, and finer, straighter tusks. Um, and you'll see there's no advantage to being big in the forest, because if you're, if you're six foot tall and trying to go through the forest, you get caught up in vines and everything else. You want to be able to duck under things. Um, and when I first got out to Zongo, uh, there was one elephant in the clearing uh, and carcasses. Because uh, there's uh, poaching camps on every stream uh, around uh, Zanga. Now uh, you go out there and you see a lot of reproduction, a lot of young elephants. The population is really uh, thriving. Um, but elephants are what we call a keystone species. Um, so uh, uh, they feed on the bark of lots of different trees, and you can see where they've been chipping away with their with their tusks. Uh, a windstorm will come along, that tree will fall down, and there'll be a profusion of herbaceous vegetation in there. There will be a great habitat for gorillas to come and munch away at the uh, stuff and dikers and other things. But the elephants are also the excavators of the forest. Again, an old termite mound, and they mine with tusk and trunk to get in at the minerals back there, but they make these minerals available to other forest animals. And this is a, a fine little family portrait of giant forest hogs uh, coming out of that, that salt cave. Um, and the uh, rotor rooters of the forest, the uh, bush pigs, go through the marshy clearings with their snouts uh, and get uh, looking for the, the uh, tubers of uh, the sedge stems uh, that grow out here. Um, but as they go through uh, in the mud, they get mud in their face and everything else, they're easy pickings for a baka coming along with a spear and having jambon on the hoof. <laughs> the largest antelope of the forest are the bungo, uh, with their racing striped sides and spiral horns. Um, the the, the uh, stripes on their side, they all, uh, make them almost disappear when they go into the dappled light of the forest. Um, and then, yeah, they'll just blend in with the forest, even though it's such a big uh, animal. Um, so the first condition of forest conservation is know your forest. You know, know what you have out there and you know, you know that this is a forest that's really worthy of the efforts for conservation. It has that richness. Uh, another smaller relative of the uh, bungo is the Sibitunga, which is a smaller antelope with, with long splayed hooves for supporting himself, themselves on the marshy soil. So you see them in the marshy clearings a lot. And the leopard is the largest predator of the forest. And leopards in the forest are constrained by competition with lions and the hyenas. So they're able to you know, tackle bigger prey because they don't have to drag it up in a tree to keep it away from uh, the, uh, the others. So uh, I've seen them um, you know, kill a bungo, you know, having a you know, right, right, you know, it's just there on the ground. But I've also recorded the first um, leopard attack on gorillas right near my camp. I heard this big ruckus in the evening um, and you know, all this noise and roaring and everything, but it was just about dark. And we went up and checked out the area, but didn't follow them. The morning we went out there, looked at the site, and it's all, you know, the leaf litter is all messed up. And there's a stick there where it looked like the gorilla picked up that stick and wailed on the, uh, on the leopard. But the leopard had attacked a silverback and a blackback. There were, you know, just two in a group. And the next morning we followed these tracks and there was leopard tracks superimposed on gorilla tracks for about four kilometers before we called them up, uh, caught up with them. And that fear odor was pretty, pretty intense. But they didn't, they didn't kill it, but they you certainly made a, a good attempt. Another time we found a gorilla toe, a baby gorilla toe, and a scat of a leopard. So this is really some of the first actual 
proof that leopards do prey on, uh, on gorillas. But aren't they handsome? They are. I mean, I think the Western Lowland Gorilla is the best looking gorilla with that, uh, that chestnut crest and uh, you know, shorter hair and sleek. Um, in the Congo, they spent a lot of time in the, in the water uh, in these marshy clearings. This is a species identification uh, <laughs> slide. Uh, you know, pick out the gorilla in the slide. But uh, uh, Western Lowland Gorillas, which wasn't known from the mountain gorillas, are much more arboreal. They, they climb trees, they feed on over 100 species of fruit, and uh, believe me, you don't want to be under a 400 pound silverback who's 30 meters up in the tree. <laughs> uh, they, they climb fast and they come down really fast too. Um, but uh, they're much more chimp-like than, than mountain gorillas. Much more frugivorous, even a lot more fruit. But speaking of chimps, there's several subspecies of chimps that are across this forest. Um, and as we know from our scientific research and the wild thornberries, um, that uh, chimps are 98% genetically similar to humans. And um, you know, when, when you see them walking bipedally, carrying a big stick and hoarding food, they really, you, know, you can see that <laughs> resemblance. It looks my, like my older son. Uh, but chimps also seem to be able to contemplate their existence. And you know, their existence is again threatened by the bushmeat trade that's throughout, uh, that's really rampant across the forests and the savannas in Africa, causing the extinction of a lot of species. But you know, chimps from this area um, were the original vectors of HIV. Uh, when, you know, about, uh, you know, so 60, 70 years ago, people were still hunting chimps, and somebody hunted a, a chimp, had contact with the blood in, in cuts on their body, there's blood transfer, the SIV uh, turned to HIV, they went downstream in their, their pirogue to a place like Brazzaville or Kinshasa, and things developed. Um, so actually, you know, th they have traced the source of HIV to this area and these chimps in this area. Uh, but also, Suzanne was talking about Ebola. Ebola has hit hard uh, in the, uh, the great apes uh, through this, throughout this area and of course with the human population in, in lots of areas. Gina? I was just wondering if you took these photos, particularly that one's gorgeous, but all of them. Have, did you take these? I took, them, I took most of them. Yeah. So, some are borrowed, mm -hmm. like this one is borrowed from Franz, uh, Franz Lanting, um, uh, a photographer uh, who worked a lot with bonobos. And the other, um, the other great ape of the, of the Congo Basin is the bonobo. Um, and you know, with that longer the hair and everything, they're, they're kind of the hippies of the forest, <laughs> you know, where, where chimps you know, you've, if you've read about them or seen Jane Goodall's specials, you know that they're very aggressive. They, they have territorial wars. They hunt. Uh, they'll kill each other. They're, they're really aggressive. Yeah, and there's, there's some, like Richard Rangham, that said, you know, traces that to a lot of human male aggression <laughs> uh, to uh, the our chip ancestry. But, but for uh, bonobos, their philosophy is make love, not war. <laughs> in bonobo group, yeah, when they have a conflict, a self conflicts or tension, they just have sex. Yeah, and it doesn't matter with whom. <laughs> um, so it's a, a different philosophy. But these I won't dwell on just to show the distribution of chimps and gorillas. But you know, the gorillas are interesting because you see a big gap in the center of the, the Congo Basin. You have mountain gorillas, uh, uh, and the uh, western lowland, eastern lowland on here, and western lowland over here uh, on the other side, and the middle is uh, empty. Because back in the Pleistocene, you know, we had climate change. It was cooler and drier, and the forests remained in refu refugia on, on the different, on, in the mountains and along some of the rivers, um, and it affected the distribution of gorillas. That's why you have this discontinuous uh, groups of uh, gorillas across. Africa. But it's a human landscape as well. 
And this is another thing that we want to point out. It's not, we're not just trying to conserve wildlife, but the uh, indigenous uh, rights and use of the forest. And this is again Makema, uh, who became a great friend of mine, but he has a crossbow that's made up from a, a tree in the forest and he's preparing the bolts. And you see the poison tipped and he's uh, preparing the flesh out of leaves. And they, they use these mostly to shoot up through the canopy at monkeys and stuff to get, to get a dinner. But they also hunt with nets. And these nets are all made by the bark of a vine that they roll into rope and weave into these long nets. And they set them up in, the, in, in a nice patch of forest and then they beat around the bush and chase the, the dikers or other animals into the nets and have dinner. So their, their life, their physical, spiritual, uh, life depends on an intact force. They also hunt uh, by mimicking the sounds of animals. And Mavanda here is using a nasal call to call in dikers. Uh, it's a, it, it supposedly mimics you know, the sound of a diker giving birth. <laughs> Basically, it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's one coming over here. And it, it really works, and everybody's sitting very silently, but ready uh, to bring home dinner. Um, and Makema is uh, using a, a leaf whistle to mimic the sound of a crowned eagle. And when the monkeys up in the canopy hear a crowned eagle sound, they think that this big eagle is going to come from above the canopy and grab a monkey. But, so the, the monkeys drop through the canopy, and they're there ready with their crossbow. You know, they, you know, indigenous people depend on the native wildlife and the, the food uh, and, and the medicine in the forest. Uh, Mavanda uh, with a yam, the Dioscoria, uh, yam. And, um, you know, if they, they're always looking up in the trees as we go along. And if they, they, they see some bees going in and out of the hole in the tree, work stops. Uh, and uh, Mungo here has made a a, a climbing belt out of the vine, and he's going, you know, this one's not so high up, got the leaves uh, burning to uh, of the, the right leaves. Once he opens up the hive, they'll put the leaves in there, and they just reach in and uh, bring home that honey. Love honey. And medicines are either something like this bark that uh, Makema has that, um, that you actually ingest, or um, when, when I was, started working with Makema, he was kind of my, uh, like I said, my mentor out here, he had bands on his ankles. And when I first got there, I said, hey, what are those all about? And, you know, I was a newbie in the forest, so he didn't want to divulge the secrets. But after I stayed around, he figured I was a good guy. <laughs> so we're going through the forest, and he, he you know, pulls some vines. And we sit down, and he says, okay, we got to a clearing. He says, okay, sit down. And he's taking, he's rolling these vines on his leg, and it, it binds them into a band like this. And you can see them on his legs. And uh, so he ties one on one ankle. And he said, Rishar, this is for luck in the hunt. When we wear this, we have plenty to eat, we never get stomped by an elephant or gored by a gorilla or anything else. And, you know, I'm here to tell about it, so I think it worked. <laughs> the other one, he, he puts on my ankle and he said, Richard, this is for fertility. And two weeks later, my first daughter was conceived. So he, <laughs> make him a claims, uh, writes, every time I, I visited him after that, I always had to bring him something because he was responsible for Deva's birth. <laughs> I don't know if I had anything to do with it or not, but... Um, so, again, the spiritual life in the forest. Here, people are doing the Jenge dance. And this mass of leaves in the middle is actually the Jenge, the forest spirit. Um, and it, they, it comes out only in an intact forest. And dances and twirls, and people are using sticks to guide it. And this Jenge is what gives the, the people the, their guidance for where to go to find honey, to find food, where they should move their, their camp. So again, that uh, their whole life is built in the forest. And 
you can see that the house is just made of imbricated uh, megafrenium leaves on a, on a, um, a frame of uh, saplings. But their force um, is being opened up by the foreign logging companies um, that not only change the structure of the forest by taking the hardwoods, but they change the demographic structure uh, of the area. What was once a small little community of Baca, the pygmies, and Sasanga fishermen, has now become a community to support the logging company, and there will be several thousands where there were a few hundred. So that they, and these people have all come for economic gain. So when they're not working for the logging company, they're taking cables like this big one, they're setting along elephant trails to uh, snare elephants and smaller uh, cap uh, cables, the uh, brake cables for bicycles for catching smaller animals. Um, the forest is being burned. Uh, when, we, when I first started doing the uh, census in this, in this, what became Zanga Sanga, we were in an area in the northern part where there's a missionary settlement. And they had a bunch of uh, pygmies, Baca, and other people gathered in a savanna. And they're telling them that their future is not in the forest, but it's cutting down the forest and planting manioc. They have changed their way of life. So, uh, you yeah, know, the, the missionaries wouldn't let one of their Baca that knew that forest come with us because they said this is not their future. So, Kame and the, the other guys, uh, we went into the forest and we go about 20 kilometers over burning the logs and down trees and everything. And we stopped at a log and I said, you yeah, know, Kame, what is it about a place like this that is so attractive for people to come? Why are people leaving the forest to come up here? And he says, well, up in this, this area, we get help, they get health care. They, they have education where they learn how to count and how to read. It, back where, he says, back where we're from, our kids die and we have no idea why. Uh, we, when we get our pittance uh, from the logging company, when we work for the logging company, we go to a magazine to buy a pair of sandals. They look at how much money we have, and that's what it costs. And so, because we don't know the value of the money. So what? But he said, but we haven't seen a track of, of, of an animal in 20 kilometers. The forest is being destroyed. The jenge is gone. The forest spirit is gone. So on the slot, he said. Well, what, you know, what can we do about this? And you know, we we can we can probably devise some kind of a, a plan to protect the forest, but also have traditional use. So that's uh, you know, we said, okay, well, let, let's 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 think about how to do it. And that's how you know, what if we do it? What should we call it? Well, Zanga is in the middle, and the Sanga River bisects the area. So let's call it Zanga Sanga. And kind of the rest is history that. We'll go through when uh, when we first, when we decided, you know, from the needs, the expressed desires of the people that live there. I, I brought down the, the minister of uh, forests and wildlife in the white sweatpants, the minister of health, to show them what they have in their own backyard in their country and the the importance of it and the value that they could uh, get for the local people and for the country. And it brought the local leaders, the, the village chiefs, uh, uh, as well as you know the, the the regular people that I was living with. And so the result of this was the, uh, the creation of the Zanga Sanga uh, uh, National Park and the Zanga and uh, Sanga uh, Special Reserve, the Zanga Ndoki National Park. Um, so the, the special reserve is about two thirds of the area, and that's where traditional use is permitted, and the the sections of the national park are, are left aside, so wildlife can reproduce, uh, uh, not hassled, and 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 keep the populations going in the reserve. Um, I turned uh, poachers into protectors. These guys were out in the forest uh, before we, we started this, and I said, look, we're, gonna, we're starting a conservation program, and invited them in to Bayanga, the town, and interviewed a bunch of people to be the first eco-guards of Zanga Sanga. And these guys, like I would have been, were out in the forest trying to get wildlife to feed their family. 
So they now uh, became uh, guards, and most of them are still uh, employed. They're kind of old men now, like me. Uh, but in the first, the first several months, we eliminated most of the major ivory poachers, and you can see the one of the halls of ivory uh, that, that they uh, were able to confiscate, and hundreds of uh, uh, homemade guns. Uh, but also, you know, we, we started a barefoot doctor program, working with a uh, local nurse, Bavon, who trained uh, Baca health scouts, who go out in, you know, out to the various uh, forest camps, and and uh, ha are, have been taught to recognize, you know, yaws and leprosy and things like that. They're co fairly common but also to treat malaria and, and those kind of things. So working with Balbon, we were able to also extend the vaccination programs all down the river and into the forest camps and things like that. Um, so uh, that kind of responded to uh, the need. Also, we started working on chiggers. I don't know if Gina has seen this from uh, uh, Zaire, but chiggers are are the chigo fleas, and they lay their eggs in the tender feet, especially of kids. And they get so many egg sacs in that toes atrophy and fall off. Mm -hmm. it's, it's terrible. Uh, but my work with the, the Bach in the Forest, I learned that they have a traditional medicine uh, for them. And I said, well, why don't you use this? And it's sort of, you know, bright lights, big city. You know, we're supposed to go to, to modern ways and those old ways, not so much. So we uh, collected uh, with them some below, uh, a small shrub that grows in the forest and, and they use the, use the root, chop it up and mix it in palm oil and soak the kids' feet in it and it kills the chiggers. So not only is this uh, uh, taking care of a, a major problem, but it's also reinforcing the value of traditional use and traditional medicines and traditional knowledge. Uh, and that's really the most important thing, to reinforce those things that are valuable. We also started a well baby clinic, uh, helping uh, with maternity, and we, and we set up um, sort of a Head Start program. Uh, small little education camps out in the forest to, with, with the Baca uh, to give them a start on learning how to read and, uh, and all. And then, you know, kids eventually went to the, the regular school and thrived. Was all of this funded by the Wildlife Fund then? Or? Yeah, it was uh, started by uh, yeah, made with small grants from uh, WWF, World Wildlife yeah. Fund, and uh, Wildlife Conservation Society out of the Bronx Zoo. That, that gave me enough money to put a can of sardines in my pocket and go out and uh, <laughs> see what's out there. But then when we started this, uh, there was a program back then that was called the Wildlands and Human Needs Program. There was USAID funded um, in collaboration with World Wildlife Fund. And looking for these kind of programs. This was, this was the early days of this kind of conservation program of integrating traditional use into uh, in, in traditional people and conservation. So this became one of the first sites of the Wildlands and Human Needs Program. Uh, and there, there was a, a half a dozen sites in the beginning of the integrated conservation and development approach. Uh, so th this was kind of one of the initial programs in that, that approach. Um, and uh, we uh, started an ecotourism program because uh, in most forests you can't see the forest for the trees but with these clearings people come and they can see forest elephants and bungo and buffalo and everything else that comes into these clearings. Uh, so we set up a platform about four meters up um, and also we uh, started, uh, when, when I started working on gorillas there were completely wild, there was no conservation. So you, you approach them very carefully. <laughs> but we worked on start beginning to habituate the gorillas to get them used to people uh, for tourism. And you know, the Baca were key to this because they're such great trackers. 
you know, so we, we call this gorilla trekking, gorilla tracking. Yeah, because sometimes you don't get to see them. But these guys, they're showing a feeding site uh, uh, of gorillas. But they'll, they'll take people in. Uh, you know, they, well, first of all, they started habituating the gorillas by having non-threatening contacts with a group of gorillas over time. They, they come to a group of gorillas, they'd sit down, they went there and they <coughs> have a really reassuring sort of sound uh, that the gorillas would recognize. So every time they approached, they'd use that sound. Until the gorillas said, oh, okay, these, these other primates are okay. Uh, so eventually they got to sit with them and eventually you can bring other visitors in. With a protocol, you don't look, stare, because that's aggression and et cetera and so on. But these guys, you know, who would have thunk it, you know, in, 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 the, in Bayanga or where these guys live, that you could actually approach these big, dangerous animals and sit with them? These guys became the rock stars, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of Bayanga because they were able to, to, to do this. And again, it's reinforcing traditional knowledge and traditional ability to be able to track and, and, and keep up with the gorillas on a daily basis. Uh, again, reinforcing traditional knowledge and use of the force. Uh, and when, I, when it's, I started tourism, I asked the Baca, hey, do you guys want to participate in this? It's something you can benefit from. Um, and they said, well, you know, in the past, people, you would come into our village, and take out a tape measure, and you put their video cameras in. Well, you don't want anybody in our villages. I said, okay, what would you like to do? They said, well, we can take them on net hunts. Uh, so they do. They use, uh, people go on net hunts and see an actual, uh, you know, real live net hunt with the, with the Baca. And collecting walks, mostly with the uh, Baca women. Uh, you know, going out in the forest and finding uh, traditional medicines and foods and stuff like that. And it's great fun. Um, you, you know, drink water from vines and um, end up singing songs. Mm. Uh, so, you know, starting from the grassroots level and building a conservation program. You know, responding to the needs of the, the people that live there and how, how do we design a program that will conserve the forest and the wildlife, as well as the needs of the people. So from the grassroots, we built Zanga Sanga, but we knew that, you know, working at the local level and the ministerial level, there's a lot of risk involved. Yeah, areas could be regazetted, you know, the same minister that, that does wildlife conservation also is forestry. So he does uh, forest concession. So we decided we had to ratchet up the political will. So we, in 1999, we gathered up the heads of state of all the countries in the area and had the first heads of state uh, summit uh, for, on forest conservation hosted by Paul Bia, the president of Cameroon, and chaired by Prince Philip, who was the uh, president emeritus of WWF. Um, and out of that, you know, the idea was this is another key condition, leveraging political will. Um, how do we get the uh, decision makers on board with doing this conservation. So out of the uh, Yaoundé summit, we call it, that first heads of the state summit, they signed a declaration, uh, uh, all these uh, countries, and they, they agreed to conserve at least 10% of their forest and protected areas, eliminate illegal logging, bush tree trade, uh, harmonize legislation across borders, uh, and looking for sustainable funding. And they actually set up a, 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 a council called COMIFAC to implement this program and to look at it. It's a council of ministers. And when the United, the United Nations saw this great effort from the, the heads of state of the Congo Basin, they made a resolution of, you know, calling on people to fund this program because it was a major uh, commitment at the highest levels and the lowest levels to, for forest conservation. So um, a, lot, a lot happened. We got millions of dollars from it, USAID and others. We created some of the first trans-border uh, programs that I'll show you on a map. Um, the, the commitment for protected areas and we developed a major regional trust fund to continue to support this. So Zanga Sanga now became the, uh, whoops, 
the uh, the Sangha River Trinational area, and going from the uh, significant area that was Zanga Sangha and CAR, uh, we uh, added the contiguous uh, parks in uh, uh, the Congo and Cameroon and the buffer zone to uh, a 28,000 kilometer uh, transborder area. So this was the first transborder peace park type of thing uh, that happened in the Congo Basin. And again, that harmonization of legislation. So uh, eco-guards from all sides of the border work together to, to, for forest conservation. So elephants don't carry passports and go across the border. Um, and you know, so we continued that. Uh, you know, Zanga Sanga is like 30,000 square kilometers. And the ne one next to that, we said, OK, how, how do we connect those uh, protected areas? And we developed corridors. Uh, where there would be maybe sustainable forest management, uh, community uh, forests and things like that connecting the national parks. So the Sandra River Crown National, again, the, the national parks and buffer zones around it. And the, this was designed by satellite imagery of uh, elephants that cross the border from Zanga Sanga, go all the way down into the Congo, and with that Transborder collaboration on uh, anti poaching, we're able to have much better control of the bushmeat trade and the ivory trade in the area. Um, so, out of this, like, the, uh, like the Congo Basin Forest Partnership was started to support them, and all the donors joined into this, this forest uh, partnership. There's over 55 uh, members of, you know, from GTZ the U uh, European Union, World Bank, all giving money to join this, uh, to, to support this program. And uh, we developed the 11, 12 landscapes, and all, all, about 40% of the forests of the Congo Basin was included in this. And here's the landscapes, again, going from the Virungas all the way out, in, you know, in the, in the Ruanzores, all the way out to the coast of the Gulf of Guinea. So 40% of the Congo Basin is in conservation landscapes, endorsed at the highest levels and the lowest levels, and it, it continues to this day, supported by USAID, the government of Norway, who gives a lot of money for climate change. What, what better climate change uh, mitigation program is there than supporting 40% of the Congo Basin? Uh, every five years we have a, uh, we have the Comey fact ministers or heads of state together this one chaired by Giscard <laughs> uh, in Brazzaville uh, to, to renew their commitments and make uh, more commitments there and you know it became sort of a peer pressure having the heads of states in this you know so uh, you know Paul Bia will say okay you know in camera I'm gonna do 15% of my country in protected areas. So Kabila down in Congo said, I'm gonna do 20%. You know, it's like, you know, I'll call you and raise you one. Uh, but, you know, another example of this kind of region-wide conservation uh, is in Namibia. And the approach in Namibia was, you know, working again at, at the community level. Co conservation is in the Constitution in Namibia. It was only an independent country in 1990, and conservation was part of the, the Constitution, and they, in law, they create community conservancies, where uh, communities will get together and decide what area is their territory, and, and set up a conservancy, do a management plan, um, we, we support them with help with developing joint ventures on ecotourism and things like that. And so now there's almost 90 uh, community conservancies along here, combined with uh, uh, freehold uh, uh, conservancies, which are private ranches that they do, uh, you know, multi-species and tourism, and the national parks. There's over 45% over of Namibia in conservation management. And really, mostly these uh, community conservancies and these beautiful other areas. And uh, another big, huge example of you know getting that collaboration. Remember, we talked about harmonizing legislation. You know, that's why we try to work across borders. 
in the Kaza, the uh, Kavango Zambezi uh, Trans Border Protected Area, it's over uh, 200,000 square kilometers uh, down here. In five countries, uh, the Okavango, you know, lots of national parks that you may have visited down in this area. So it's one of the, now the largest, and like the Comey fact in Central Africa, this is all endorsed by a treaty by the heads of state. This Kaza and the uh, the Comey fact is now a treaty, so it's 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 bigger, you know, than uh, just uh, individual countries doing protected areas. It's a it's a regional thing. Um, so the other, you know, even if you develop these big contiguous protected areas and networks of landscapes, you still have wildlife crime. Um, and so then the other thing is letting people know that this stuff um, is a problem. We did major campaigns on uh, uh, stopping uh, poaching and trafficking of some of the major species that were used. Uh, you know, wildlife, uh, the illegal trade is incredible. In, like, for example, in this area in, in South Africa, poaching increased by 3,000%, and most of the rhino poaching happened in South Africa, the country that we think has got the best uh, program of conservation in, in Africa. Well, when you have the Vietnamese mafia influencing the vets out there, and millions of dollars uh, go into you know, getting rhino horn, that's what happens. Um, so we, we you know, look for commitments, again, commitments from the highest levels. This is in Gabon, where the, the head, head of state, Ali Bongo, uh, had, uh, had one of the you know, Afri ivory burns that you've heard about across Africa and even in this country, where they assembled all the confiscated ivory and work pieces, put it in a big pot, uh, pyre, and lit it on fire. A big public statement, uh, uh, and so we're trying to have these kind of events to let people know that ivory poaching is not going to be tolerated. And so, trying to keep the forest alive with my, my family in, in, in Africa, we've all, uh, you know, Mekama, when he was young, he was a Tuma, a great hunter. Um, uh, Kame is a Ganga medicine guy who all knows the medicine. And the rest of us old geezers are Kombete, the old, the old men of the forest. So now, uh, Mekama has become a Kombete with me with my gray beard, become a silverback uh, out there. <laughs> But, so, um, we, I, I've showed how we've tried to keep the canopy, keep the forest alive in the Congo Basin and other places in Africa. How does this translate to what we're trying to do with Rick, uh, Dick Wilson sitting back here uh, next to Gina? Uh, how, we, how do we bring this on home? You know, our walk through the, the Congo has ended up in Kerry. So, what we're trying to do is the same process. Uh, inform the, the public, um, work with decision makers. Uh, people all know, just like with the Baca in the forest, that uh, uh, the forest and the flowers are, give you a sense of peace and well-being and calmness in your life. It's important not only for the, the uh, ecological services, but just for our own uh, peace and, uh, and well-being. So there's Richard Wilson here um, at one of the uh, Arbor Day uh, festivals or something in Cary and showing that, uh, try, tr showing people what the, what the situation is to try to get more uh, popular support for keeping the canopy in, in, in Cary. Uh, educating uh, the, the community and um, developing uh, guidance for the town of Cary, <laughs> because it, it seems like you need to spell things out a little bit to, <laughs> to say, here's what we're trying to do, here's what's important. We care about trees, we care about having a, a nice environment in our town. And you know, the town of Cary developed, has an environmental advisory group and developed a tree committee, and they made very similar uh, recommendations that uh, Richard and I and others have been uh, trying to uh, move the, the decision makers and carry to make. 
uh, to set a canopy goal. Uh, you know, of, and they recommend about 44 to 56 percent of the canopy, the tree cover of uh, Cary, be maintained or reestablished. Um, you know, in, in 2016 it was 46 percent, uh, but the 440 acres are cleared per year. Um, and this was done by um, George McDowell, he, he made these uh, calculations. Uh, with the vehicle population increasing by uh, five cars per day, four tons of pollution per car, uh, uh, a mature tree estimates absorbs about 50 pounds per year of pollution. Just, so to offset the pollution for each car, we need to plant 160 trees per day. Instead, we're clearing 120 per day. We're going in the wrong direction. That's why we're trying to do the same process that we use in the Congo Basin and Namibia, work with the, the, the population to get them behind it, to make, put pressure on the decision makers to make some changes. Uh, so it's the same for the, the Baca and the same for us, that our cultural, spiritual, and physical values depend on an intact force. And some parting shots. <laughs> the end. <laughs> well, that, that's our little walk through the forest. I hope your feet aren't too wet or uh, muddy. <laughs> ah, that's a good question because that, that's what I did my in my PhD on the feeding ecology of these guys and they feed on over 300 different types of food plants. Um, like I said, about 100 different species of fruit. Um, but you know, what people didn't know is the amount of uh, insects that they, they, they'll sweep ants off the forest floor. Um, but you know, you know, chimps you know, have that nice maneuver of using sticks to break into big termite mounds and, uh, and munch on the, on the termites. Well, there's a species of termite called cubitherms that has a pagoda-like structure against trees, and gorillas just take, rip them down, because they're, they're pretty big, you know? And they break them up into fist-sized pieces, shake them in the hand, and pop them in for snacks. And that's a major component of their diet. Uh, but they also feed on the pith of ginger, um, a type of wild ginger that grows there. That, that they, you know, they break it open and eat the pith, and it smells wonderful, and it's, uh, they love it. Um, and a lot of other different herbaceous plants, mostly herbaceous plants and fruit, but uh, uh, lots and lots of insects. Yeah. That's another reason to keep the canopy. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And they use the canopy. Like I said, the mountain gorillas, they don't have, have as much structure. It's a, it's a, it's a lower forest. Uh, they climb, but not as much as lowland gorillas. And uh, lowland gorillas are, like I said, more chimp-like. They're up in the trees a lot um, and eating a lot of fruit. What about these trophy hunting programs that you hear that's supposed to help conservation? Uh -huh. What's your take on that? Well, if it's done right, it, it's a, it, it does. It can, it can help conservation. In Namibia, for example, on the community conservancies, the community working with the wildlife department makes, develops a management plan for the whole area and the wildlife that live there. Uh, if they have a joint venture with a tourism lodge, they, they design the tourism plans and everything that people use. But they also have joint ventures with safari companies. Um, and they set the quotas um, on there. So, you know, if they, you know, a safari company might come in and take a kudu, maybe an elephant. They, in Namibia was one of the few countries that's, not anymore, but had rhino poaching and mostly uh, allowing people to call geriatric rhino. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's, I think it's ended. But safari hunting, you know, the, 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 the funds and the meat goes back to the communities. So they profit, they, they get a, a big chunk of, of the, the money from the tourism and the safari hunters that goes back to the communities. And that money, you know, not, you know, it provides jobs for the eco guards that are protecting the community, the, the, the management structure, but it's also health care. 
It's uh, it, you know schools paying teachers. Uh, so the you know by managing and increasing the wildlife, they're able. Yeah, you know, and Southern Africa is a more of a u utilization area. The sustainable use is a big thing in Southern Africa. So if it's done right and it's done sustainably, it can benefit and really uh, raise the standards in these communities and these community conservancies. So it can be it can be good if it's done properly. It's not always done properly in in some areas. Uh, yeah, so it's it's got to be controlled. And in some areas, like in, in Central African Republic, I worked up in the savannas for years uh, on rhinos and stuff like that. But it's an open border, and there's no there's, the government is so weak that you know the Sudanese poachers would come in from Darfur area and on horseback, leave their cattle up in the the the, the they burn ahead, and get a flush of grass, leave the cattle, and go off on their little Arab ponies with big spears and run down elephants. And this was a, a hunt that's been going on for centuries. But when I was up there. I don't know, late 70s, early 80s, early 80s. Uh, they just with spear on horseback. They they killed about 10 percent of the herd of elephants that was up there. In the early 80s, when the war started in Chad and Sudan, the spears were replaced by Kalashnikovs and rocket launchers. The elephants were down by 90 percent, and the rhinos gone. Uh, just by these horsemen, and these horsemen, the you know, Jean Jouid and you know, brought out, you know, hired by the government of Sudan to create all the atrocities that we've heard of in Darfur, the genocide in Darfur, and against the strikers uh, now up in that area. So they're, they're tough guys. Is malnutrition rampant? Because that little kid that was in the yeah. Jigger yeah, yeah. thing, he had a very a swollen belly. stomach. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's a combination. Yeah, you know, actually, in the forest, malnutrition is not the biggest issue. Parasites is. Oh, it's uh, parasites. So par parasites can really, uh, you know, get you know hookworm and everything else uh, from the wa waterborne or soilborne. You know, so people are full of parasites. Um, uh, you know, in the forest, people, you know, the the vaca have much more protein in their diet as well as as cocoa, there's leaves and things like that that they use for sauces, the yams that we saw, so that their ability to find food and, and have, have a better diet than people maybe up in the savannah where there's not so much wildlife, there's not so many resources anymore, you know, so their nutrition is actually better down in the forest, but parasites, you know, it's not that malnutrition doesn't happen, but the parasite load on top of the things, um, uh, you know, causes uh, you know some of these kids to be stunted in those chiggers in their feet. Um, you know, if they get so full of chiggers, you know, they're starting to walk on the side of their feet. Keme, you know, the Ganga, the the medicine guy, he had so many chiggers. He walks, you know, and he's adult. His knees are he's knock kneed. He walk, but he, you know, he'll walk, you know, hundreds of miles uh, through the forest. Um, you know, people adapt. Uh, are they still having uh, pressure on cutting down the forest? I mean, is that something that has to be dealt with on a regular basis? Constant, uh, constant. You know, we're, you know, a lot of the European logging companies have been replaced by um, Asian Chinese mostly uh, logging companies, um, and. As much as possible, you know, regulations are supposed to be followed, but it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of ability to, you know, take a lot more than you're supposed to. Um, you know, the the help that we have is that, like, with the Congo Basin Forest Partnership, we have all these major donors that have considerable influence. You know, as well as us, you know, to to help to limit the the really destructive logging practices. But it still happens, and it's not only the logging that happens, but they have to get them out of the forest. So they make a lot of roads. You know, like in in Zanga Sanga, the the logging company was Slovenia was from uh, Yugoslavia. 
in the houses. There are pictures of Tito all over the place um, back in the day. So they, they, they make a, a, major, a major road every kilometer and every half a kilometer secondary road. You know, to get it, to get the trees. You know, they have the Baca go in and, and find the trees and mark them, and then they lay out the road system. But those, yeah, you know, okay. So they take it's very low density logging. They take a couple of trees per hectare, um, so it, it's not destroying the forest. But those roads are major clear cuts, and then it's access, because you know, in the past, the you know only the Baca knew their way around the forest could get way into the interior of the forest, but now they have a rope. Anybody can strap their basket on their, their shoulders and go out and follow those main roads and a secondary down to a stream, set up a camp, and, and, and uh, uh, lay out your cable uh, snare trail. And so, you know, the access to the forest is one of the major problems of, of logging. How about the Gary? Where's that 442 acres? To yeah. Kind of yeah. And yeah, Richard might be able to speak to it a little bit, but um, they, yeah, it's like everywhere. It's kind of a border-to-border -border development plan. Um, yeah, and they want to have everything from one side to the other developed. You know, develop tax base, et cetera, and so on, and build up the community. And uh, we're trying to argue that hey. We, we need to take an opportunity that we have before it's all gone to try to protect what we have and try to increase that. Um, Richard's working very hard. He's kind of the lead person on Keep the Canopy. Um, and uh, we have meetings often with the, uh, the town staff, the technical staff, and with the town council members um, to try to get some support uh, to do this. And the, the, uh, the uh, Tree Committee of the Environmental Advisory Board, they may, they, th that's kind of, you know, it takes it up a level besides Richard and me and a few others going in and banging on the table. You know, that, that's now an official group that they sanction to, uh, you know, it's making the same recommendations, so that reinforces it. Now we have to get them to take action. And we've talked for several years, <laughs> uh, you know, and there's a lot of yes, 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 but a lot of dragging their feet. I lived in Reston, Virginia during oh. its development, mm -hmm. and it was planned from the very beginning of how things would be arranged. Mm -hmm. And when we go back there, it still seems like Reston, mm -hmm. where Cary, they want to make it a town, but I don't quite see quite what's happening and happened in Reston. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like there's no long-term plan. Exactly. Well, yeah, we're not trying to I'm, say I'm, I'm not that they shouldn't develop. I'm just saying that oh, yeah. there's a real contrast. Right, and there's a lot of places, there's a lot of examples that we've tried to show to the town of Cary that this can happen. That there's a lot of towns, there's a lot of, uh, you know, in the United States and, and around the world that have made a development plan that maintains their forest cover or increases their forest cover. It can be done. It just takes a commitment. And, you know, if they're, you know, just state, making a statement like the Yaoundé Bay Declaration that we're committed to doing this. We're committed to a 50% canopy and carry. Now, what are the tools that we need to get there? How do we do this? How do we get the LIDAR maps and how do we do all the, the calculations to see what force, you know, will create a corridor uh, down with the greenways uh, and the parks that are there? How can we put this together like we did in the Congo and Namibia in a town like Kerry uh, that has the same pressures, you know, in Congo it's logging, in Kerry it's development. Uh, you know, so how do we kind of funnel all that into a plan that will keep us in business. Yeah. Is there anything being done or pressure on a state level? And the reason I'm asking this is I had an area behind me that was wooded and it had a riparian buffer, a 40 year blue line stream. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know, I mean, I kept researching all of this because I was trying to stop the development. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, I went to Diener, the state mm -hmm. level, 
And what I found out in the end after spending, oh, hours and hours, was the state allowed the city to rubber stamp things, mm -hmm. and the city allowed the developers expert, and they rubber stamped it. Mm -hmm. So it was like when the city went <laughs> rogue, there was no one you could go to because yep. the state, and Diener just had such a turnover. Mm -hmm. And you talk to someone there and they'd say, yes, you can fight this, this is blue. And then, then later it's like, oh no, this has already been approved. Yeah, this, this, so, we, we, we've experienced something like that where you know, the, the town staff will say, you know, that they ha have a, a more, a, a larger buffer along streams than the state mandate is, for example. But, you know, they'll say, oh, well, it's a state, state rule now, and we can't over, you know, we can't go against the state rule, so we have to do what they say. And <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. And yeah, Richard, I don't know if you have, you know, some ideas on the, on the state level. No, I know that the towns are all um, um, desperately afraid of the state uh, because the, uh, uh, the development community has lots of friends in the state legislature and everybody's afraid that if any of their local environmental rules or development rules or restrictions or, or um, uh, appearance rules offend the wrong uh, developer, that there will be a law that says that you can't do that anymore. Hmm. So, and that they may just take another chunk out of what the city can do uh, for punishment. Yeah. Could some of this be brought out in papers? I mean, people just don't know that, you know, it's like I've talked to a number of people and they're like really surprised that, I mean, I spent, we, I had just retired and I, I mean, I was researching soil maps. I was, you know, like I learned a lot of things just by trying to research and find out, you know, what was going on, the type of soil, the, you know, the blue line street, you know, all of that. But it, like in the end, it was already, I found out done before we even got a letter from the developer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I didn't know that, you know, it's like, how do you stop this when it's already approved before you even know about it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. So I just wondered, like, I, I mean, because I tell people and they're really surprised. Mm. And I'm thinking, boy, if there could be some good reporting on this, like, why yeah, are people like afraid? The, why the are Corey and Raleigh, that's three counties. And mm. it was all done. It's all rubber stamped. That's why they're having a big court case now. But that's the way business has been done in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good luck with that. We got so many fronts, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the other thing, another thing that the town is mm -hmm. confronting is um, um, paying their bills, uh, because a place like Cary has has um, been able to do a lot and make a make a very good town because of money that comes from development fees. Yeah. And now, as they mm -hmm. they've only got about maybe fifteen percent of the land left, it's going to be a source of that fee, so they have to try to figure out where to get that money from. And that was been their consultant when it comes from density. Um, and density includes wooded residential areas becoming less wooded residential mm -hmm. areas uh, that go higher. Mm -hmm. But the in density also results in increased costs for yes. schools in exactly. and and I mean, the density does not make sense to mm -hmm. me. Well, what they say is that you know, it, it's it's going going vertically doesn't cost as much to the town as going horizontally because you don't have to build so many roads and so much pipeline. Okay. Excuse me, if you have a house that has six bedrooms in it and you have a two-car garage and you're not allowed to park on the street. I mean, there are rules in Cary that are just plain stupid. And those, <laughs> those condos that are going in, there is no place for those children to go to school. They haven't built those schools yet. I mean, it just does not make, I know, I'm preaching to the choir, you're just as frustrated with it keep, as I keep am. Keep going, it's fine. But, but the density argument does not make sense. 
It does. Well, it does for public transportation, and it does for protecting agricultural land. Okay. Which is lost. And protection. There is no public transportation where I live. But there never will be as long as we spread out. That's one of the big arguments for density. You, there, that makes sense to to have public transport when there's only one house here and one house here. And that's why you need the density. There aren't. You know, there's a neighborhood with houses, and they don't have huge yards, but they have yards. Mm -hmm. It's more than a strip between two chairs. You know, mm -hmm. they have a little bit of a yard. Mm -hmm. And that density supports transportation in so many cities. I don't see why it wouldn't support transportation here. Well, there's a cost ratio. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are some transportation that could be put in. But then land use gets into mm -hmm. it, too. We have go carry and stuff like that. I don't know how many people use that. I rarely do. Um, but there is a public transportation, but you have to go to the, the spots, the stops that uh, they use. So I guess it could be accessible if people want to use it. I was just wondering on the reforestation in um, a town like Cary, what, what kinds of things are going on? Because it's, I, think, I think you said that there's not much lo a left of Cary to build on right now, right? beyond going up, you said that there. So what about reforesting or adding canopy yeah. to the neighborhoods or, mm -hmm. or the, the giant corporations we have around? I mean, is there, are there efforts to do it that way? Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. is, what are the benefits you gain from that versus a preserving a forest? Yeah. Or do both. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not well, that's what we're trying to do is actually do both. When we're losing 240 acres per year, 120 trees a day, we're going, this, the trend is going down. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a combination of, of looking at what exists that we can add to, you know, a conservation program, like with the bond issue, there's money for uh, purchasing open spaces and other parkland. Maybe that's an opportunity to do some conservation easements and things, you know, the, the, on land that has forests. It might be a mixture of exotics and, but it's forest, you know, and develop, uh, you know, to try to develop the corridors. But we're also trying to do some reforestation. And with George McDowell and Richard and others, and my son's scout group, we're going out mm -hmm. this Saturday. Um, um, on a, a greenway area in in Cary, and we're planting trees. So we're 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 starting. Yeah, this is really George McDowell's. You know, he's running for mayor. His initiative. Uh, he's trying to develop what he call what he calls a tree archive. Uh, you know, to plant native species, get them going on a, an area of greenway that uh, you know has been, you know used for development and everything else, the trees are, you know, how can we use that as a demonstration site? So we're going out this Saturday, got a bunch of the, the, the scouts uh, going out to help and um, see if we can get that started and then build from there. So are the developers forced to put in, I mean, couldn't carry past legislation that said developers have to leave room for trees in front of all properties that are being built so that there is at least a street canopy? Well, there's, 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 there's rules on the books, but they're not always yeah. followed. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the construct, you know, we were just talking about, you know, some old trees in front of the McDonald's where they redid their sidewalks and things like that, and the Richards documenting how the tree is declining. Uh, because the root system has been cut, uh, you know, to make the extended sidewalk. There's uh, driving trucks and bulldozers across it. You know, the tree's gonna go. Um, you know, and uh, you know, developers will come in, and you see this all over the place, and plant, you know, cut down the, the native species and plant, uh, you know, all kinds of exotic things, uh, and stick them in there. Uh, on a berm, so they're not able to absorb water, with volcano mulch, you know, halfway up the trunk of the tree, those trees are all going to die, and they, they're not valuable trees. Instead of, you know, thinking about how to do it so it really absorbs water, you know, flood control, you know, flood, flooding is now 
oh, well, so, a huge issue in Cary. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Well, we've wiped out most of the trees. Mm -hmm. We don't, every parking lot is, you know, burned and not, you know, not designed so it will actually absorb rainwater. Things that they could do and things that are on the books, but they're not enforced. And when, when we, we ask at one of the meetings, well, what, you know, why don't you do this? Well, this is what developers know how to do. They know how to make cheaper. curbs. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's cheaper. They know how to make a curb. They know, yeah, you know, this is what we do. You know, instead of, you know, there's regulations for how to plant a tree. Trees are mostly improperly planted. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not, you know, planted at the proper depth. They're not, you know, there's, you know, you know, in a, in a situation so they can absorb water. You know, it's just, but there's rules, you know, on the books on how, how to plant trees, but they're not followed. Well, are there regulations? I was just disheartened because there's a, an old shopping area up, you may know, where um, you go out Glenwood Avenue in Raleigh. On the right, there was Fifth Avenue and Beyond and the mm. Marshalls and stuff on the left side. Used to be Fat Daddy's and now it's Panera. But they redid the parking lot, and I don't think there's regulations as a new development. They cut down 100 year old trees mm -hmm. and put those little stick yeah. things in yeah. there. And they're all dead already yeah. because they're just on the berm. Yeah. You know? With creep myrtles on a berm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what I got when, okay, so they preserved this basal area because, again, I read all the you know, yeah. regulations of the city of Raleigh and because behind me, I'm in the county, but behind me where they developed is the city. So I'm reading all of this and it says 10% basal area. Okay, so, so when we had some trees that got lost in this area, they fell down it because the roots were cut. So we call the person that's in charge of the forestry on the, pla on the you know, development plan. And it turns out he's the one that wrote the regulations and he gave me this double talk. Well, it's a basal area. I'm going, so it's not trees within the area? Like, well, no, it's not individual trees that we're concerned about. It's this basal area, and I still could never find out. And then the more I start asking him, the more annoyed he got at me. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, we're t protecting 10%. I'm going 10% of what? Yeah. If it's not the trees within the area, then what are you protecting? You know, mm -hmm. well, he just got, re you know, I never did get a real straight answer. So that's kind of the yeah. thing on the book, on the paper, sure, it looks fine. But in reality, it probably was seven and a half percent, you know, yeah. of the trees that yeah. got protected, not ten percent. Mm -hmm. You know, and ten, ten percent is well, no, it's no, something. No. It, you know, it, it should be more. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. you look at, you know, the trends in conservation now, it's fifty percent. You know, look at uh, Edward Wilson, E.O. Wilson. You know, his big thing is that he's saying as an eminent scientist who, in his 90s, who's mm -hmm. published everything, you know, on everything. <laughs> he, his book on Half Earth is saying that, hey guys, to present, to, to prevent the extinction crisis that we're in, uh, and if we protect or conserve 50% of the earth, we might, have a chance. we might have a chance to conserve maybe 78% of the species. If we don't, you know, we're, you know, you've all heard about the, you know, sixth extinction and, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're going out of business fast. <laughs> you know, you combine the extinction crisis with climate change and, you know, we got to do everything that we can to plant trees in our own yards and mm -hmm. convince others to do the same. <laughs> that um, sometimes we forget that um, the one thing that often will change the minds of people who work in government is data. Mm -hmm. And we see that you use yeah. it at the higher levels right. all the time, but we forget that, you know, if one person goes out and collects data for on, you know, that small plot you're talking about and mm -hmm. shows, no, you didn't preserve the ten percent, that data will change their mind. Mm -hmm. You calling them and saying, Hey, I'm not sure you really did this right will probably just get them upset because mm -hmm. um, they're caught in a very difficult position. Um, but if you can show data, um, so that's something we all can do on a small level in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, like go around and track your trees, yeah. you know, and keep track of them for the next five years, and yeah. then you have 
something on a piece of paper that they can't dispute. Mm -hmm. And, and they, things will change if you do, if you do that. Soil erosion events. You know, you take pictures. Mm -hmm. take That's photo. what it will change them. And then, because then you can go to the media as well. You can go to the newspapers. Yeah. You, have, you have a story built for them. Everybody likes it when you do all the work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to do the actual groundwork. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to mention, too, like a lot of times the processes in government at all levels are really typically pretty slow. Mm -hmm. um, we just never hear about them until it's already all happened. Um, so making sure you know how those processes work can be helpful too. Oftentimes we don't find out until we've gone through a situation. Yeah. Yeah. Like with healthcare, you, know, you find out on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've known up front, you would have been able to do something. Mm -hmm. so, okay, but you can request that information too. From, they're required to give it to you yeah. if you ask. Well, yeah, we've, we've been pushing the town and give, you know, Richard developed a whole outline <laughs> because we were talking and talking and talking. He said, we've got to be more prescriptive here on, you know, what, what, what were some suggestions for doing this? Dedicated people to really work on this, not people that have six other jobs. Um, you know, a dedicated group of people to work on this. Um, to look, look around at what other places have done for some inspiration and to know that, hey, th this can happen, you know. And Richard's provided a whole bibliography of, of towns and cities around the world that have done this. Uh, collect the data. You know, we've been trying to get the, you know, from the time we started three years ago, they have LIDAR, they have satellite images, they have all the tools to mm -hmm. analyze the canopy and, uh, you know. Yeah, you can just use the tools that they already have. That, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, instead of inventing the wheel, right. reinventing the wheel, right. hiring a consulting company yeah. to do it, they have the tools. They just have to give the mandate. They have, the, the, the town council has to say, the town of Cary, lo and behold, from this day forward, is going to create and maintain a 50% canopy in Cary. Staff, this, this component of five people on our staff are dedicated to doing this. We're hiring an urban forester you know, with a technical background to help do that. We're going to work with the town naturalists to, to look at the areas that have the most potential and, and where we can, you know, they, they, they have the tools. We just, got, they got to make a commitment to using the tools. You know, we can, Richard and I, can't afford LIDAR. You know, we're not going to go out and, you know, do uh, surveys in every forest to, you know, analyze the canopy. Mm -hmm. They have the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. They just got to make a commitment to doing it. And that's the hardest thing, is getting that political commitment amongst all the pressures that they're facing of development, yeah. you know, tax base, etc. You know, Congo Basin, logging companies, the, 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 the money that they get from logging companies because they don't tax people. You know, that, you know, all those pressures that, that's on a government to do it. So, you know, you know we, we, can, we can go to the Herb Fest and, and hand out literature, talk to people, and everybody tells their story, their, their little testimony about the trees that were lost in the neighborhood, and sign up and be on our email list and our, our um, uh, Facebook page and things like that. But yeah, you know, so so getting that, getting more and more people, and when when we when we go and talk, a few of us, Richard, George McDowell, me, uh, you know, some people from, you know, it, it just actually grew out of our garden club in in Stony Brook, <laughs> uh, and we, you know, our members of the of the club, we go, and and we say we're not just you know five people, we're representing you know three hundred people that that are you know, supporting Keep the Canopy. So, you know, they want to know that people care. That it's not just, you know, us, you know, pounding on the table. George McDowell does most of the pounding on the table. <laughs> we try to feel a little bit more reasonable. But, but make good points. He said, damn it, we have the laws on the books. Why don't we do this? Why don't we plant our trees properly? Why don't we plant native species? This is all there. Why don't we do it? That's why he's running for mayor or town council or something. 
Um, but you know, it'd be great to have more advocates for this. You know, we've been working with the council that we have, and we get some support, um, but not a lot of action besides this uh, environmental advisory board's commitment, which reinforces things. Now, the, again, there's got to be commitment. Sometimes you can find a person, you know, within a government somewhere, and go to them, and if you can do, if you can convince them to do. Uh, like a pilot project mm -hmm. type thing. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a big one, exactly, yeah. but just something small where yeah. you, can, you can take them some data and you can say, you know, it's not gonna cost you anything extra, could we just do this? You yeah. know, and then you get them to draw it up with their fancy yeah. exactly. you know, technology, yeah. and so they, it's all on their, their equipment, their, you know, their technology, that means more to mm -hmm. them. <laughs> they have a technician who's done that. Yeah. And then you do one little project, and then, then you just kind of start putting the word out about that little project, and means the word gets around. Mm -hmm. And then there's somebody else out there who wants to try something like this, but they've never really known how to get started on it. You know, within the government system, somebody else wants to try this, and so then they see, oh, well, you did this, so hey, you could try that over here. And it slowly grows that way. Well, we're hoping that this tree archive, this tree planting that we're doing this Saturday, will be the beginning of that. We hope that it's going to be filmed. Uh, I think Dick said some council members are going to be coming. Um, they're invited. They're invited. So there's an opportunity to be a part of that one attempt to do that. There was an example that we put forth a year and a half ago of a development project program that was happening in Cary along uh, a strip of, uh, of road where they were digging it up and removing the, um, the great myrtles and things like that. And we said, hey, here's an opportunity, you know, for, you know, if you're doing this project anyways, do it right, plant the right species of trees and things like that. But uh, it's gone ahead without, you know, without that happening. Well, that looks like a great place to stop. I'm afraid the questions yeah. keep on going throughout the rest of the day. That was fascinating, Richard. Thank you so much for coming out today, everybody.